Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to University of Illinois Extension. We are so happy to welcome University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension and, and Defy Illinois, uh, both of those organizations on uh, with us, Illinois Extension today, um, wanting to bring to you uh, a program about justice impacted and people of color who are overcoming barriers to economic mobility and uh, really excited to hear about the, the program that is now running in Illinois and Wisconsin. This is um, uh, just a, a pleasure to have you on here. We have Melissa O'Dell. She is the executive director of Defy Ventures Illinois and has been on the Defy Ventures team for the last eight years. Um, and so we're happy to have her on. She can uh, share some of the ins insight that she has had from the programmatic perspective here. Um, we also have Diana Hammer, um, who is an associate pro professor uh, and also in the Division of Extension at the University of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Madison and uh, has also been a community development educator uh, in Wisconsin as well. And so uh, great to pull from um, the research base and the the also the field. Uh, and finally, our own Joseph Malawal, uh, who is a University of Illinois Extension specialist in community and economic development. Um, we stole uh, Joseph a few years ago and are really um, happy that he's back on the platform this year. Um, we hope to always have him on at least once a year. He's, he's got a great, uh, unique set of um, programs and uh, disciplines to, to share with us. And so we really appreciate having this program on our platform today, the leadership shown with bringing this forth, uh, such an important topic to discuss today. And so we're very grateful. And without further ado, I'll pass it on to our panel of presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I'm Diana Hammer, and I'm going to start today. It's uh, really nice to be in an Illinois extension space for a change. I grew up in Illinois. I work in Wisconsin now for 16 years I've been here, but I grew up in the rural Rock River Valley in Ogle County in the northwest part of the state. So um, I love Illinois. I'm really happy to be partnering with Defy Illinois, and it's um, great to share the journey with you of how we um, programmatically found this partnership and, and what the collaboration looks like. And yes, I'm very sad that Joseph is not with Extension in Wisconsin anymore, but if he has to be anywhere, I'm glad he's in Illinois. So um, this is fun to be all together here. So um, getting started, we are going to um, hopefully cover these points. The main um, outline will be starting with some research we did in Wisconsin around entrepreneurship with people of color, and then how that led to us partnering with Defy Illinois. And then um, Melissa will share more about what's going on there for you all to get involved in if you'd like. And so um, I will kick this off with the entry point that I had as a community development educator and extension I'm in Fond du Lac County right now, which is in the northeast part of the state. For context, the county has about 100,000 people. The major city is Fond du Lac at about 44,000 people, and it's 90% white, um, not a major immigrant receiving destination, not a place that um, is getting a ton of traffic from immigrants or others moving in or out. Uh, and yet we have a lot of entrepreneurs of color in the area. And in 2014, 15, uh, Joseph helped me with a study to meet them, find out what, what they're up to, um, how can extension be useful. And then we shifted gears in 2019 to look specifically at black business owners. It was important to get that earlier survey, but all of these groups are really different, have a lot of strengths and uh, barriers that are unique to their situation. And we wanted to really understand that. And these bar charts here are showing why no. this is a critical thing for us to think about from both an inclusion, an inclusion perspective and from a civil rights perspective, if we're really trying to reach everyone in our community equitably. Um, business development, it was not doing it well. As you can see on the left, this was um, Wisconsin business ownership by population. And on the right, we have um, the area of our study in Northeast Wisconsin where uh, there certainly are 
uh, is a bit population based, but there weren't as many businesses as we would expect for the population. So that's why we were trying to figure this out. Joseph can now talk about what the role of extension is in situations like this, where we identify a need and um, the community and other leaders are trying to figure out what to do next. Thank you, Deanna. And I'm I'm so glad I'm still close to Wisconsin, so we can yeah, you know still uh, collaborating and we actually switch. You know, you, you are from here, and then I came here. You are in Wisconsin, so um, so happy to work with you. I think this uh, this uh, program is um, I think if anything um, that I miss a lot in Wisconsin is uh, to see this program growing and uh, making an impact uh, in the life of uh, people that are affected by justice system. And, and and other uh, conditions, social uh, issues. So um, this is, I just want to admit that this is really um, a, a small part of a bigger uh, project, research projects and uh, that Diana continue to work on. Um, and I continue to follow up and see what is happening and a lot of things are happening. So we don't have time for all that. That could be a completely different a presentation to talk about the story of this really very uh, good story that I like uh, the most. But we are looking at what you know. Given all this information and the situation, you know, we are asking ourselves, you know, what what can extension do uh, to help communities uh, looking to solve these problems? Uh, and one of the things that we do in extension, we do we are part of a bigger uh, organization institution, so we have expertise in research, uh, so that we could we can generate. Uh, primary data uh, uh, and bias knowledge that could be used by leaders to make decision in solving these problems. Um, we also we are also embedded in communities. As you look at the extension, we have many program areas, and this particular area is community and economic development, of which Diana and I are part of. So our work is we are embedded in communities. Either we live in that community or we or we are in contact with them on a daily basis. So we know their problems. We have built some relationship with them. So we are in a better position uh, to collaborate with organizations, whether they are local, uh, community-based or government agencies to help with uh, technical assistance, being training or other things that uh, they may be lacking in their community. Also, we uh, not only do we provide education, we also help liberate resources uh, for the community, uh, whether th that is uh, information uh, um, or even financial. Sometimes we are involved in grants, even though we are, our mandate is to provide education, but we also help with, you know, grant writing and, and information about how to access resources, especially if they're going to address issues that is connected to our work. A big part of what we do is, uh, uh, capacity building, where is community planning, um, using the data to actually think about how to address issues from the perspective of people that are in, in, impacted by whatever the situation is. So we see a lot of things that um, we could do in extension, especially when communities are organized and willing uh, to pursue a, a program that can address issues that are affecting people of color. And I'm going to turn it over again to Diana to, to move forward. Um, thank you. Yeah, sounds good. So um, all of those things Joseph just talked about is what we started to do here um, with the attention on Black business owners in 2019 again. We had a nonprofit partner who was interested in doing this as a Black business owner herself. We were fortunate to get a Black research assistant who could do same race, low barrier conversations for us that were recorded and transcribed. And 48 entrepreneurs in four counties participated in the research. So we had a wealth of information that I'm still sorting through. So what you're hearing today is initial conclusions, but um, it was really phenomenal to be able to get that much participation and that much input around our research question of how could extension and other business development entities provide meaningful, meaningful support for these entrepreneurs, which they weren't getting, we didn't think. And um, that was confirmed in the study. So 
Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but if you are interested, like Joseph said, we can definitely go deeper. Um, a key question we asked was, why were people starting businesses? What was the motivation behind that? Uh, a huge range of answers here, um, major themes being to be independent, to be able to set their own hours and rules, be able to hire who they want, do what they want, um, and have more freedom than a regular nine to five would allow. Um, we also asked about access to financial resources and um, learned that most of the people had financed their businesses themselves. So they were either working another kind of regular job to be able to fund the business on the weekends or um, you know, out of their garage in the evenings or whatever. Um, only 13 had applied for formal lending. And of those, only a few actually got what they needed. Um, of the four here who got loans at startup, they told us that wasn't enough. They got a little bit, but it wasn't really what they had hoped for. And a uh, ton of reasons for that, including um, discrimination, not having compatible businesses with what the banks wanted to fund, and some other things like um, lack, of lack of collateral, insufficient credit history, that kind of thing. So there's much more to explore there. The main theme, though, was that even people who hadn't applied for loans and those who had felt discouraged in lending and that the banks weren't really going to be supportive. So why, why even try? Uh, then we also asked, what's it like to be a Black business owner in a predominantly white area, which all of these places in Northeast Wisconsin were? And we heard this range of answers. Um, and then even though it wasn't stated explicitly as much as I personally had, it, had expected it to be, it was still in the background very clear that there was a lot of pressure on them that they were feeling for being so visible, um, worries that people would... Um, connect their success or failure with every other Black business owner in the area. So um, that representation was a concern. And then um, this last point here I really liked, it was um, the importance of building trust by demonstrating consistency in my integrity. So that, that knowledge ahead of time that they're not just going to be trusted, that they're going to have to earn it. And to earn it, they have to show up the same every day and have excellent customer service and be dependable because that's not a given, um, the way someone else might just get benefit of the doubt. So um, some initial conclusions we had from looking at this uh, was that the independence and the ability to generate wealth for their families was a key reason they were doing it. Um, the business development services that we have many of in Northeast Wisconsin, in Wisconsin as a whole really, um, they're free, they're public, they're available across a range of technical areas of business development, but we're not being utilized by this audience. And the few that had tried to interact with them um, weren't getting what they needed and the time they needed it and the place they needed it and the way they needed it, that kind of thing. So um, a need to really understand what this audience needs or each individual business owner, as the case may be, and um, address that to really be able to move them forward. And then uh, financing really wasn't a thing. They were out to do it themselves or not at all. And then uh, that consistent factor of racism underneath kind of um, putting pressure on working against them in a lot of ways. So um, pausing there to shift back to Joseph again, um, as we think about the systems around us. Thank you, Diana. And I just wanna um, also add that, um, when we presented this, I don't remember when last year or two years ago, a big question was how were you able to actually conduct research uh, with 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 people of color? You know, what was your strategy to reach to get the right information? I think one thing that was very very clear was the relationship that was established uh, by Dinah with uh, uh, people of color, and also having somebody, uh, an African American man. Uh, and a person, you know, a recent graduate did the research himself. So that was the method that we used and it was qualitative. So it was an in-depth um, interviews and talking with people and, you know, 
lasting from one hour to even sometimes one and a half hours. So, and we were allowed to record this as a result of that trial. We actually recorded this, this interview and we could analyze them and we can hear their voices and all that. So just to add that, if you ever want to do something like that, uh, it's not a research, it's also a research and outreach and, and relationship building, which is very crucial uh, for people that have uh, lost a lot of uh, trust. So anyway, moving forward with this, um, the picture that you see there, uh, so I've done some research also in Wisconsin uh, with, uh, with uh, people affected by justice system and, and other issues. And what you are seeing there is a drawing from community member that was looking at how do we solve this problem? What are some of the issues that are affecting people of color and, and people that are affected by justice system? What are some of their concerns? So you look at the head there, that is a person uh, and this and this was by a nurse, a person uh, who was a nurse for how many years? Uh, some thirty years, and she and she heard people talking all the time. When they come to the clinic, they are not talking about their physical issues; they are talking about issues that are social. So she put this together and she showed us. And she said, "If we want to address these issues, this we have to look at the person and think about." the variety of issues that are affecting that person. So that was a very a key thing uh, for me to think about. Um, next slide. The other one is uh, in that process, uh, there was an initiative to actually help people uh, when they are out of jail. And one of the things that we did was to ask people about to frame, to design a system that would be effective to help them uh, reintegrate and, and heal in the community. The word reintegration and healing are key words that came out from that from that uh, dialogue. So after talking with this person, uh, she went back to her jail cell and then she came back and she drew this one and she gave it to a uh, sheriff and say, take this to extension. This is what I want to see being done. And that was really uh, very touching because it, it, it just gives you how people are very, very uh, sophisticated in thinking about how we could resolve these problems and, that, and the importance of taking their concern and aspiration and priority into consideration when we address issues like that. So what it did to me was, okay, you know, uh, from a community and economic development perspective, what would be, a, a, you know, a holistic way to actually frame these issues uh, and, and, and bring about a change that is uh, uh, lasting and sustainable? Next. So that took me to this framework. It's called a community capital framework. If you haven't heard about it, it's a theory of change. You know, we are dealing with a very, very old problems. You know, it is not new. And, uh, and we are looking at how to change it. So what are some of the practices that best practices and concept or principles that are used in the community uh, to, to, to bring about change? So you, you look at the capital, those are called community uh, capitals. There are seven of them. And, uh, and in the middle of that, you see uh, economic security, social inclusion, a healthy ecosystem healthy ecosystem. You can, you can put your own things into the center, but the idea is, is that you want to be able to understand these capitals and their function in the community and how they can be earnest and can be used to address an issue from a holistic and system perspective. So we are, we are, we are still talking about how we can apply this uh, theory, a concept to entrepreneurship, especially with people of color, because we understand that um, entrepreneurship is not only your motivation, your you know your curiosity, your intelligence. It's also what the social contact does to you as an entrepreneur. So all the resources that we need, all these resources, are embedded in 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 the in the community. And so you will need some way to be able to access them. And we know that a variety of uh, of, uh, of factors, including race, a gender. And other, and other uh, factors affect people, the ability to leverage this resource in their community. So that is how we, you know, looking at how do we look at this from a, a big picture perspective. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jody. So as we got more sophisticated, we meaning me and others around me, I think most of me, um, got more sophisticated in our understanding of the context that people were starting businesses in, and then thinking about how extension resources could contribute to a solution of all kinds. Um, we were thinking about this, the community capitals framework and the ways that 
um, we were hearing that business owners were were not enjoying the full amount of these capitals that they could and were not able to create more as easily as they wanted to. And um, at the same time, the, these other headlines were coming through in Wisconsin. This was 2019, 2020 now. Um, there was quite an effort, maybe that happened in Illinois too, um, the public health associations in Wisconsin started declaring racism a public health crisis and asking organizations to sign on to that. It was um, announced in several publications that Wisconsin was the worst place for Black Americans to grow up and try to live. Um, we were seeing a lot of income-related consequences from incarceration, which is happening at a very high rate, especially in Milwaukee County. And uh, putting all of this together, we're trying to figure out what, what can Extension do um, to have a meaningful impact again. Um, this is another data slide. Um, you've probably seen something like this before. Entrepreneurs of color um, exist in prisons um, and people of color in general are overrepresented in prison. Um, in Wisconsin, this is what the numbers look like in 2019. And that was having a tremendous impact on their families and their communities that were missing out on their wages as they're at home. So um, a few things we started to do was think about, is entrepreneurship being taught in prison? And if not, is that something we could do? Um, another more local response was to create peer groups of business owners so that they could talk and learn from each other more more so than extension educators or business development folks who we knew were not um, quite there where they needed them to be yet. Um, our coworker Mia Young is on and I bet she can drop the color bold link in the chat. That group um, still exists and it's um, entrepreneurs of color guiding each other to create stronger and better businesses in Northeast Wisconsin. And um, she's been quite involved in that. So it was neat to be able to do a local and pretty quick response to some things that came out of this research. And then the work to think about how we can um, target just as impacted people in an entrepreneurship and personal growth program took a lot longer, but we did figure it out um, after finding Melissa. We learned that there would be a way using Defy Ventures model to create a supportive community where not just the business could be developed, but like Joseph was getting at, the whole person and hopefully some of those community factors could be addressed too to help people create their enterprise and move it forward in a world that was gonna be supportive of them and their goals. So I will shift to Melissa now to tell you more about how that works. Thank you, Diana. I'm really excited to be here with everyone. I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about Defy Ventures. So Defy's mission is to give people with criminal histories their best shot at a second chance. And we do that by leveraging entrepreneurship as a tool. Uh, and we hope to be able to cut recidivism in half um, to uh, have a more just and inclusive economic ecosystem. Um, and Defy is a national nonprofit. Um, I'm really thrilled that I get to lead our efforts um, in Illinois, um, but we're actually in eight states throughout the country. Oops. Um, so what we're trying to do is create pathways to financial independence for people who are currently and formally incarcerated. And we do that not through just best in class or um, uh, economic, uh, uh, academic components, but rather we also leverage a pro-social community of individuals who believe in second chances for the individuals in our program. We call everybody in our program EIT or Entrepreneur in Training. We believe that language matters and it's really important that we're creating a humanizing environment in everything that we do. And we hope that through this, um, both through the um, uh, um, information that we're providing to our participants, as well as creating this network of volunteers who are doing coaching and mentorship for our EITs, that we're actually moving the needle um, and creating um, a cadre of fair chance employers for people as they come home, um, and also shifting policy and shifting the mindsets uh, that many people in the broader community might have about those who've been impacted by the legal system. 
So how do we do what we do? Um, as I mentioned, we are an inside outside model, um, which means that we begin our work while people are still in custody and we continue providing services as people come home uh, back into the community. Um, we have a signature program, which is called CEO of Your New Life. And here in Illinois, um, we offer that in three state institutions, two that serve men, the Kiwani Life Skills Reentry Center, and the Pontiac Correctional Center. And we're also serving women at the Logan Correctional Center. So CEO of Your New Life is a very holistic and rigorous, uh, definitely not for the faint of heart, a program uh, that engages anywhere from 40 to 50 individuals at a time in a closed cohorted model. Um, it's about six to nine months in length, and it focuses on career readiness, personal development and well-being, reentry support, and entrepreneurship. Um, we also offer this program in transitional settings, so uh, um, in like step down facilities, halfway houses, and, and the like. Um, after people come home, uh, folks are immediately enrolled in our career and reentry pathway. Um, so we're supporting individuals by making sure that uh, we gift them a Chromebook, we do digital literacy, we're getting them connected with um, additional um, career readiness workshops. And as I mentioned, making sure that they're connected with meaningful employment and that uh, might be with um, employers that we know about or that we've given them the skills to go out and find employment um, that is right for them. And we will serve people in the entire state of Illinois, so it does not matter where people are paroling home to. But I should mention uh, for those uh, folks who are kind of curious, about 54% of individuals who are incarcerated at the state level in Illinois are returning back to the city of Chicago, and particularly to about seven or eight neighborhoods on the south and west sides of the city. So we are definitely hyper-focused on what's going on on the west side and on the south side. We also are serving people uh, who um, may be impacted by the legal system, but have never been at the institutions where um, we're currently uh, doing our CEO of Your New Life program. And so we have a free entrepreneurship boot camp that we run twice a year. It's a 17-week virtual program. Um, and we also offer a free business accelerator for folks um, as they go uh, further along the entrepreneurial journey. So I was mentioning kind of our best in class um, curriculum, and this is a curriculum we're really proud of because we have developed it. Um, it is evidence informed. It has been vetted by the Drucker School of Business out of Claremont Graduate University. And it's composed of um, a, uh, a four book series that's almost 2000 pages of content. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, not for the faint of heart, people have to really commit to the program. Uh, individuals in the program also will do deliverables. That's what the EIT return packs are all about. We'll talk a little bit about the rubrics, how across the Defy network we are um, looking at what actually constitutes good or excellent in terms of a deliverable, and how we also leverage technology with our partnership with Google um, and how we're using Google Classroom um, in our post-release work um, to give people more access to resources. We also um, train up our own staff with, um, again, a very robust uh, internal training, and we have facilitator guides that also allow our folks to go inside the institutions on a regular basis and administer the program. So it is extremely high touch. So this is just a little bit of a, an overview of the different strands of our curriculum. So over time, we have evolved. Um, when I first came on to Defy in 2015, um, we were only a post-release program and we pivoted to go inside the institutions because we realized that it was all about building trust in order for us to actually change behavior, we had to first change thinking. And that's done through person-to-person -person relationships and giving people uh, really meaningful content. And so um, our vice president of learning has developed a whole different uh, schema uh, of uh, various curricula that we use in different settings. So CEO of Your New Life, as I mentioned, we're offering that program um, in state prisons um, and in transitional facilities. We also have um, a program that focuses on young people. Um, we call that the business lab. Um, and Diana could probably talk a little bit about that too. Um, but that again is taking a look at you know, positive youth justice um, and adolescent brain development in the infrastructure of the program itself. So it's not like we just put an adult program and just plop it on to a, a youth uh, um, population. Again, we are being very mindful and intentional, making sure that we are um, looking at the best practices of what actually reduces recidivism um, in the right context. And then we also have the, the entrepreneurship bootcamp. As I mentioned, that is a 17-week 
virtual program, but we also couple that with a, a two book series. Um, and so uh, everybody who's in our program gets these materials free of charge. Um, again, Defy is a nonprofit. And so we raise philanthropic dollars to be able to uh, provide our programming. And then we also have our free business accelerator. So that's for individuals who are in the community who have either graduated from CEO of Your New Life or from boot camp and want to um, get access to higher level entrepreneurial content. So what we wanted to show here is that we're not just sending people materials and saying goodbye and good luck, but it's actually a very much of a, a wraparound kind of supportive environment. And this was, again, in response to, um, you know, things that we were learning that entrepreneurs uh, who have been impacted by the legal system needed. They needed both the academic component Component, but they needed that pro-social community around them um, and access also eventually um, to uh, non-dilutive capital. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So um, every participant, every EIT, um, as I mentioned, gets a series of textbooks. They also are able to work on their deliverables um, in what we call the EIT portfolios um, or return packs. And this is a way for them to start mastering the content and actually um, not just hearing about it in a didactic way, but actually taking the material that they've learned and then processing it and doing assignments. So that way we know that they're actually applying the new concepts that they're learning. Um, they return those uh, materials to us. When they're in custody, we actually um, scan all of those materials and we digitize them. So that way, when they come home, they're actually able to, to get them as PDFs um, later on. So that's another benefit of the program. So across the DeFi network, all of us are trained um, around what, what, what does it mean to produce uh, excellent work or good work, or what does it mean for something that might need improvement? And so we're all trained on these rubrics that have been developed with our vice president of learning um, or, around uh, norming. Um, so that way that there's consistency across the network. Um, so it doesn't matter uh, if you get trained in CEO of your new life in Wisconsin or in Illinois or in New York or California, there's going to be that consistency. And that really is, I think, the power as well of the program um, so that people are, you know, there's a level of certainty in terms of the programmatic delivery. Um, as I mentioned before, we are a high touch model. So DeFi um, facilitators, we call prison program facilitators, um, come into our program. Um, they go through very extensive training with our vice president uh, of, of programs. Um, and they um, get a set of facilitator guides. So they have their own uh, book that they are constantly being able to go back to. Um, they also are able to um, obviously um, have the answer keys to quizzes and things of that nature. So that way that they're always um, equipped to um, uh, provide the best, um, best academic environment for our students. So what is the pedagogy that underscores our programming? Um, we are really vested in, again, being an evidence-informed modality. So we think it's really important that we're creating um, a, a learning environment that is looking at the best practices of how to work with adult learners, how to work in an incarcerated setting, how to be culturally competent, trauma-informed and relevant, and also using data to continue to be nimble and pivot where appropriate. Um, and that, I think, is, um, again, another benefit of our program. So when we talk about evidence-informed, so we are actually um, connected with the five keys to reentry well-being, which was developed by Carrie Pettis Davis and her team, uh, who are now lo located at Florida State University. And so um, every uh, component of the curriculum is actually connected back to these five keys. So um, all the chapters are going to connect back to uh, various components. So we're striving to make to make sure that we're connecting people to meaningful work. We're making sure that people um, have uh, effective coping skills um, and positive social relationships, that we can change thinking again to change behavior and that there's pro-social engagement. All of these things matter, not just for what's happening inside the institutions during our program, but also as people transition and come home. 
We also feel very strongly that it's important that we create an inclusive learning environment. So DeFi is very intentional. Um, as we said, I think even at the beginning that we talk about our participants as EITs, entrepreneurs in training, um, we will uh, allow anybody to come into our program that the prison is uh, deeming able to program. So we do not discriminate on type of sentence, length of time served or length of time that people have left to serve on their sentence. And this is really important because we have opened the aperture of, of, um, of being able to engage with folks, many of whom um, have been inside institutions for quite some time and haven't actually been able to avail themselves of ed educational or vocational opportunities. So we were extremely deliberate in that program design because we felt like um, people deserve the opportunity to transform their lives no matter what has gone on in the past, if they are ready to make that change. Um, that being said, we are mindful of, um, you know, trying to meet people where they're at. Um, some limitations, our program is only in English. It hasn't been translated to other languages. Um, and it is, um, you know, pretty much at a reading level about seventh or eighth grade. Um, but again, we try to meet as many of our participants uh, where, where they're at. So how do we do what we do? Um, again, um, this is a, a an iterative program. So we want for it to be a discussion oriented. It's a closed cohort model, um, but we want for it to not just feel like a lecture and could be completely didactic. So we um, are having small group discussions. As more and more cohorts go through our program, we actually incorporate peer facilitation. So graduates of the program can come in and help um, other individuals in a each one teach one kind of perspective. And again, um, as you saw from um, the discussion of the curriculum itself, we were very deliberate to create a, a vast body of knowledge, but it's not a correspondence class. It's not like we just say, here are the books, goodbye and good luck. Um, it's very interactive. So there are opportunities for people to apply their knowledge. And then we're also bringing in members of the business community um, to provide coaching and mentorship along the way. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so again, I mentioned that we were data driven. Um, so we have embedded um, uh, assessments um, into the curriculum. There is a pre and post perception survey. Again, that's tied into the five keys to reentry well-being. There are also um, assessments around educational mastery um, into the, uh, that is embedded into the program as well. So there's like a, 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 a midterm exam and a final exam. Um, individuals who uh, complete at all the components Components of the program and pass the final exam actually get a certificate of entrepreneurship from the Drucker School of Management. So this is the real secret sauce to defy and probably the part that I get the most excited about. Um, and I think Diana uh, can attest to this too, um, is that um, we are able to engage members of the broader community and also uh, most specifically the, the business community to be volunteers and mentors um, and come in and support folks both while they're inside and as they come home. And this is a vital part of our program because as we were saying, we wanna shift mindsets um, to uh, give people with criminal histories their best shot at a second chance and we can't just do that um, unless we're helping people get proximate and understand another human being's life experience um, so it's not just about learning um, how to read a profit and loss statement it's actually about connecting on a human empathetic level so this is um, a, a photo of me uh, leading one of our, our signature um, exercises. It's called Step to the Line at the Pontiac Correctional Center. So we have volunteers on one side and EITs on the other side, and we kind of say a series of, of statements. Um, and uh, if it's true for you, you kind of step to the line. If it's not true for you, you remain uh, where you were. And the idea is, again, to create that empathy and that understanding that more often than not, we have a lot in common and we don't always uh, think that. Um, and it's an opportunity to kind of see that visually. It's a very powerful exercise that we do. Um, and the idea is that, you know, people can take these experiences um, and use their power and their privilege in whatever way that they feel, um, you know, is a comfortable and appropriate to hopefully shift the needle and, and give people who are um, impacted by the legal system more access to educational and vocational opportunities. So we often get you know, asked, okay, so after CEO YNL, CEO of your new life is done and people graduate, 
what's next. Um, we really want to emphasize that our training inside prisons isn't is just the beginning, um, and that our participants are not required to start a business in order to participate in Defy when they get out. It's really actually about again a community of support, and we want to make sure that people are stable in their reentry when they come home. And a big thing that uh, you know we do here in Illinois is build partnerships with other entities. We don't have Defy housing. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm not cool like Oprah, I can't give everybody a car when they come home. Um, you know, we only have, you know, uh, you know, certain resources. So it's incumbent upon us as an organization to find other entities and build a true continuum um, and make sure that we're kind of playing quarterback, um, you know, making sure that we can get people to the right services um, and, and fill gaps where appropriate. So some things that we do in our career and reentry work is a lot around mental health and well-being. So this is a photo from a virtual uh, program that we started called Real Talk. So it's just a space where people who are impacted can come together um, and really share what's going on, provide resources and support to one another. Because again, there's so much wisdom in the room. Um, it's not for me or you know anyone else uh, who doesn't have that lived experience to just um, perceive that we're going to come in and have all the answers. Instead, we create forums for people to interact and support one another. Um, I mentioned at the top uh, of this conversation that we gift every single individual who graduates a Chromebook. We do digital um, upskilling with them. We develop an individualized action plan that meets their goals and needs that's differentiated for them. Um, again, rather than mandating that they do certain things. Um, there, I think we can all attest, there's been a lot of mandating going on and, and a lot of uh, commanded control uh, for our folks. And so we really want to flip that script around. Um, we also do um, uh, various uh, workshops where we partner with other entities in order to, again, um, build up people's skill sets and connecting them uh, with what they need when they come home. And the focus very much is on employment. And it's not just any job. We want to make sure that these are living wage, sustainable positions that hopefully have that career trajectory. Um, so we are really serious when we talk with our employment partners that if you're just looking for a body, <laughs> this is not this is not going to be the partnership for you. We are really making sure that people are getting into work that um, is going to to move them up um, uh, uh, in terms of their own aspirations. These are some photos of our EITs, um, some of them who've gone through our boot camp, um, some of them who've come home and we've gifted them their Chromebooks. Um, we did a, a, a meet and greet, like a, a community connections hangout in Peoria because we have many of our folks who are uh, leaving from the Kiwani Life Skills Reentry Center going to the Peoria ATC. Um, so we wanted to connect with them and their loved ones um, and just you know have share space and break bread. It's about fellowship. It's again, not this program, if I can impress upon you is not just about uh, creating small enterprise. It's really about, you know, building up people and, and telling them that, yes, something may have happened in your past. You may have done something and, and you took account for it, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be, um, you know, dismissed from the community forever. We want to welcome you back in and we want to give you opportunities. So um, the entrepreneurship pathway, um, as I mentioned, is also for individuals who are, are impacted by the legal system in some way and who never got to take our program in custody. Um, we all, I think, can attest that the collateral consequences that somebody experiences due to their conviction can have lasting impacts on their lives, even if it was 15, 20, 30 years ago. And so we wanted to develop a program um, that could uh, meet that need. So one of the ways that we did that was, again, that free business um, boot camp that we offer two times a year. We have um, 25 seats in that boot camp. We're actually starting one um, on February 6th um, in Illinois. We're excited about that. And Diana can talk about the ones that she does um, up in Wisconsin. Um, and we meet two times a week on Zoom for about two hours each time. Um, and we're you know, teaching all the foundations of business, but we're also incorporating the volunteer component too. So we have members of the business community come in uh, during that that cohort uh, three times virtually to do 
business coaching, we have a deep dive, and then we do a pitch showcase. Um, so folks are able to get real time feedback um, on their business and help them kind of move forward in their entrepreneurial journey. I think that we all know that sometimes these kind of resources are very difficult to access or people don't really know about them, or sometimes they can actually even cost a lot of money. So the fact that this is a free program specifically for people who've been impacted by the legal system is, is pretty great. Um, people who graduate from CEO of Your New Life um, and graduate from the business uh, boot camp can also meet up together in the free business accelerator. This is where folks can get access to higher level entrepreneurial content and are actually paired one-on-one -on -one with their own executive mentor. And during this process, they're launching their business, they're um, building out, you know, and formalizing their business plan, their financial model, their sales pitch deck, um, and a sales pitch. Um, and so again, we're not saying to people here, just some videos to watch or here's some papers to fill out. This is a very hands-on comprehensive model and people can be with Defy for extremely long periods of time. We have no cutoff. You can be part of the Defy network sort of in perpetuity. So this is just a snapshot of one of our graduates um, from boot camp here in Illinois that we were really proud of, of the work that he put in. So he um, he did our boot camp. Uh, Greg was um, very committed also to hiring other individuals or working with other individuals who'd been impacted by the legal system and taking what he learned in entrepreneurship um, and sharing that with others. So he had come in initially with a landscaping business and through the boot camp, he actually pivoted and made a consulting business for people who wanted to learn how to launch landscaping businesses. And so he was able to, again, do that each one teach one and was able to make a pretty significant amount of money in a short amount of time from when he graduated our, our program. He also pitched at a uh, competition that we had through a partnership with TechRise out of P33 and won $10,000, again, in non-dilutive capital. So this was, um, you know, for some folks, this can be the jet fuel that really helps them, you know, get to the next level of their business. Um, the thing that I also really love is that he bought a building in West Gar Garfield Park and has been renovating it and turning it into a community center. So we just see that people who have been impacted want to be pillars in their community. Um, and we just need to give them a platform to be able to do that. We also partner really significantly, um, continue to do so with um, Wisconsin. Um, we're kind of like the Midwest region and like <laughs> always connected with one another. Um, and um, Diana, I'll turn it over to you a little bit if you want to just talk about um, the conference and how we've collaborated. Sure, yeah. Um, we've learned here that EITs want to be recognized as entrepreneurs, deserve to be recognized as entrepreneurs, not just as justice impacted people or um, you know, formerly incarcerated folks, whatever the label is, and creating networking events where volunteers and EITs can get together and really all jam around um, our shared interest of business development and entrepreneurship and personal development too has been really important. So uh, last June, we convened in Milwaukee County, and these are photos um, from that event where we celebrated a boot camp graduation and then also had panel discussions and volunteer appreciation and then other fun coming again in June, 2024. So we just wanted to leave you with a little bit um, around our impact um, and then of course, open it up to questions. Um, but we're really proud that the Defy Network maintains a less than 10% recidivism rate. Um, and you know that is compared against a national average of the, it can be anywhere from 30 to 50%. Um, and we have really seen that we're able to, um, you know, make inroads in, in reducing recidivism, but also um, shifting mindsets and building again, um, a broader um, case for support that this is not, um, you know, this is also a business case, right? We have a, an amazing pipeline of talent who are eager to work. And we know that there are many employers who need that talent. And so we have become a trusted partner um, to, to bridge that. And so um, across the Defy network um, in 2022, uh, we served uh, almost um, you know around 766 people uh, through the CEO of Your New Life uh, program and the bootcamp program. And we engaged over 500 volunteers. Um, uh, and, and we think that's, again, very significant because we've been building these corporate partnerships, too. Um, 
And in 2022, we had 71 EITs come home. We gifted them all a Chromebook um, and 80% found employment within 90 days. Um, and then 58, per, uh, 58 EITs graduated from our boot camp, um, and 27 people um, actually launched, and we were able to help accelerate their businesses um, in 2022. And that was all from our 2022 um, annual report, and we're annual report um, uh, 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 for 23. So. I just kind of end there that, you know, um, you know, there, this is a movement um, and this is something that, you know, everybody can be engaged in. Um, there's no wrong door to walk through to be um, a, a participant or a volunteer of Defy. And so if you're in Illinois um, and you'd like to get involved, we have business pitch competitions in, in the prisons I mentioned. We have business coaching days. Um, if uh, for whatever reason um, you're not able to join us in person, but you'd love to participate virtually, we have um, several opportunities um, that that, uh, I'm sure that we'll put out uh, through these training materials and in the chat ways that you can get involved virtually. So I hope that um, this was, um, you know, uh, in informative to you and that um, you will engage with our programs moving forward. Thanks so much. Thank you, Melissa. Um, it was really important to get that overview from you and we thank you for your time. Um, really, thank all three of our presenters today and want to give you all just a, a chance to add anything else before we jump into questions. Okay, so we um, had an early a question early on asking, has Venture developed alternative curriculum and training materials that support those with learning disabilities? So um, as I mentioned before, um, while we are always trying to make our program as inclusive as inclusive as possible, um, we have not been able to meet every single, um, you know, uh, level of accommodation. And a lot of that is also based on um, on the prison as well. Um, and so, you know, what right now our program is like, it, it's in English and it's for um, individuals who have like a seventh or eighth grade reading level. Um, but relative to, um, we, we are not looking at uh, whether or not people have committed certain offenses. Um, and again, we will work with people who even have life without parole role. Um, we try to, again, have a very um, uh, diverse cl set class. Um, so it's all different, uh, all different aspects of people who are inside. Uh, we don't uh, just kind of cherry pick uh, individuals and say, oh, well, you're three to five years to coming home. And so only you can come into our program. We try to, again, create a very expansive uh, admissions criteria. Thank you. And so um, just kind of adding on to that question, would you say it's, you know, completely um, normal to like at, if somebody has a uh, an additional type of expert uh, that they could come along and sort of accommodate or that um, perhaps there would be volunteers that can um, explain or um, have an ability to self-identify as a specialist in, in that regard? Or do you, have you seen volunteers mm -hmm. that, that have come on in that regard? Oh, absolutely. We've had volunteers who, you know, kind of use their superpower and support EITs in many different ways. Um, one thing I will also say is the power of community and the peer support that happens in the classroom. Just recently um, at Pontiac, um, we are working with the most secure population, the protective custody folks there. And um, during the midterm, there were several individuals who, you know, were comfortable taking tests. Um, and there were some people who had not taken a test in 30, 40 years and had a lot of test anxiety. And so without um, doing anything of giving, you know, their compatriots the answers to the test, there were a few folks who are more auditory learners as opposed to visual learners. And some of the people who finished early said to our facilitator, may I just read the questions to this gentleman over here so he can understand them better. And you know what? They And the facilitator said yes, made sure again that nobody was doing anything untoward. And that person successfully passed the exam because 
somebody else noticed that he was struggling with the reading aspect and wanted to step up and say, how can I help? So I think that that is really, again, the power of community and the way that we're trying to, again, it's not uh, statistically significant and it's not, you know, um, something that I would say, you know, uh, can always happen, but it's a place that I have noticed over time um, in, in running this program that people uh, find ways to be supportive. Thank you. Yeah. And I see some folks are chiming in. Uh, we have one that said audio materials would uh, substantially expand the population of those who would be able to benefit from the program. Um, and uh, so that that's a really interesting um, um, point being made and uh, really hear, great to hear that there's already some nice sort of one-on-one -on -one level supports being done. Um, and there was another question about the what kinds of ideally peer-led or other behavioral health supports exist to assist people within the program? Um, well, I'll let Di Diana jump in too. Um, I, I will just say that, you know, again, part of the DeFi model is to uplift um, the, the peer facilitation. So after the first cohort transpires, then we, um, you know, can have anywhere from, you know, five to seven um, peer facilitators um, from the previous class kind of step up uh, and be trained to help the next class. Um, and so that has happened, um, you know, pretty pretty organically from the start we know we knew that we wanted to you know build up the leadership um, uh, opportunities for people who are graduating and especially if they were not coming home anytime soon what we found um, within institutions anyway is that there are people who have very lengthy sentences who become the de facto teachers and supporters and now we're seeing more often than not they are being able to get like certifications and so forth but that's already been the culture and the tone and tenor and so we just you know kind of leveraged the wisdom that was already there uh, because it's really not our program it's everybody's program and everybody has something to give and again we don't want to step up and say oh we have all the answers we want it to be very collaborative thank you I can add that in Wisconsin, the prison rules are much more strict around um, leadership roles that incarcerated folks can take. So we have not been able to start a tutor program, but we have, or a peer facilitator program, but we have started conversations around what that might look like with alumni jumping in in the future. And um, for the mental health component of that question, the curriculum, CEO of Your New Life, includes many, many chapters that relate to personal well-being, self-awareness. Um, there's one on ACEs. There's one on self-limiting beliefs, things that we tell ourselves that get in the way of our goals. Um, meaningful apologies. When have we needed one and didn't get one? What would it sound like to give one? Who's on the list of people I maybe need to apologize? And how might that sound if I want to take that step? Also, all of the program facilitators are getting trained more and more trauma-informed delivery methods and just components of, you know, what does trauma look like and what might a reaction look like in your class and how to respond to that. And in Wisconsin, we have been able a few times to bring in the psychological services staff at key moments to kind of be in the room or just aware even that, you know, today we're doing the chapter on depression so they can check in with folks later on. Um, so we are trying to make sure that there's a, a um, prison is not a safe space, but at least, um, some awareness that people are doing some really hard things here and um, to the extent that they can get extra grace and support, we want that to happen. Um, to, and so we're promoting that, although it's not entirely in our control when it's in custody like that. Thanks so much. And I actually added a question to the chat. I just think this is such a, a an amazing um space to work in. And I think it aligns with a lot of other organizations, missions, sometimes very, um, very closely and others broadly. And so, you know, for extension, an extension system, would you think it would be appropriate for extension agents to be trained to do some of the aspects of this work or uh, to partner with uh, organizations like Defy or yourselves? And I guess in, in terms of Defy, I would want you to answer that for Defy, you know, or um, do you do you work with partner organizations aimed at a similar mission and train them to deliver the curricula? 
Go ahead, Melissa. Uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted by Donald's question in the chat. I was just about to respond oh. to him. But, um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, right off the gate, I would say that, you know, we would welcome any and all educators um, and, and particularly, again, people who um, have that connection to um, the, the business side of things to come in and be coaches and mentors. Right. I mean, that's an easy access point. Um, we can, in, you know, have you help our participants around their resumes, their personal statements, basic business ideation, come in and be a, a judge at a competition. Um, and then certainly, you know, um, the more that we are partnering um, there are ways to, um, you know, even lead some workshops, something, a cool collaboration that we're just doing here in Illinois recently with um, uh, an organization that focuses on financial literacy and credit recovery is that we actually have their educator um, zooming in to our folks at the Kiwani Life Skills Reentry Center uh, once a week, and it's like a 10-week module. So, like, there's a lot of different things that we can be creative with because of our relationship with the Illinois Department of Corrections. Um, and, and the way that we fostered that over time, that we can try and test out some things. And so I think that we um, would be very amenable to wanting to work with any institution that sees um, how that they have a set of uh, an expertise or a set of services that might be complementary to what we're doing um, and how we can, um, you know, provide that service to our EITs, whether that's in custody or post-release. And in Wisconsin, we've answered that question by extension, uh, creating a license agreement with Defy Ventures. So we are um, program providers trained to deliver the curriculum and facilitate the events in the specific way that all the other states are doing it. And um, the extension employees that we have are for the most part entirely dedicated to that role at this point. Um, takes about 20 hours um, minimum, I'd say, per week to lead one cohort in prison. So I think that could certainly be explored down the road for sure with like a half and half extension role maybe or um, something like that. Also, uh, yes to all the things Melissa said about volunteers. Extension educators are great volunteers. Uh, you know what a good resume looks like, what a good professional uh, presentation sounds like. All of you in local government roles are really well suited to uh, come in and bring inspiration and support for um, what folks are doing, working so hard to turn their lives around. And also, um, I have asked some of my colleagues here to help with volunteer recruitment, getting the word out in the communities right around the prisons where we are, who would easily be able to make a quick drive over for the day and um, help out. So. That's been nice too. I think extension with usually somebody in every county has a really good sense of who would be most interested in doing this and and feel um, feel like that was important. I'm very much very happy to talk more um, about how this can look. Also, um, underscoring what Melissa said earlier about potential employers, all of you know folks who are looking for employees right now um, who can stick around for the training and to actually do the job for a significant amount of time. And uh, we know that our EITs are more prepared than average to do that and will value that opportunity more than the average person too, quite likely. So um, in all of those ways, we're all part of this systems change. Thank you. And, and, There's a, and, and yes, go the, ahead, Joseph. The relationship that extension also created, um, a lot of people that, you know, have these issues of, you know, just as impact on other issues, they are lacking a lot of very, very important uh, resources. And one of them is connection, you know, what we call social capital. So they may have some relationship that, uh, that are within, you know, among themselves. That doesn't get them anywhere. But if, you know, when they interact with these volunteers from different background, different, you know, socioeconomic class, they start to think differently. They start to make connection. And then that human connection, you know, will start to play out and people will just spiral, you know, up and, 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 and just kind of discover completely new worlds around them. So it's a it's a it's a two way change. You know, we extension is we're changing too as a result of interaction with people, and people are changing at the same time. So it's a very rich, uh, um, you know, uh, complementary type of, of of work. Thank you, Joseph. Um, there are a few questions that talk about 
what needs to happen to expand this into more correctional facilities? Um, and so can you speak to what a correctional facility or even a, just a jail, like a simple jail, county jail or something, what someone would, would need to do or at what level of management would this service need to be organized? I can quickly answer that in Wisconsin. Uh, we're incredibly fortunate that the Department of Corrections pays for the in-custody version of this. And so I get um, the tips from them on which facilities are interested in trying something. The workforce challenges that the prisons are experiencing has really been a major barrier. They don't have enough staff to do their normal operations, let alone try something new. Um, once we get a program rolling, though, it is not very time intensive for prison staff, um, if our educator is able to come in and do their thing. Uh, the events are a little more complicated. We're basically hosting a party in the middle of a prison. And so there's, um, after the first two or three, we're all clear on how that's going to go. But it's um, it's not usually on the list of prison employees daily jobs. So um, that can take some planning and, and thinking through. But once it's going, uh, it's fairly, fairly easy and routine. And um, I just wait for DOC to tell me where we can go next. And getting the getting you know connected with the right person, always there's somebody there, you know, in any group of people. That's one person that wants want to do something, and you have to find that person to kind of break all the other barriers and get you. In my case, when I was in Wisconsin, it was through the, I think the name was Criminal Justice Collaboration Council. I think it was the name. And and just through that, you know, it is it just things start to change completely because of one person that was very passionate that believes in people change and second chance and things like that. And and that person was able to break all the barriers and it became very easy to work with uh, you know with that population. Yes, and just doing a quick uh quick Google, I see that there is like a real big federal grant that the Justice Department grants over a hundred million dollars um, per year to support reentry programs and that uh, correctional facilities are eligible. Do you think that would be helpful to provide education on a funding opportunity for correctional facilities to, per to perhaps fund programs like Defy? Definitely, yeah. The connections of if we can offer programming in custody, during that transitional time when people are getting back on their feet, coming home, and once they're ready to start their business and moving that forward through the accelerator portion is um, usually something that really sets this apart in um, both in outcomes like Melissa shared and in funding potential and partnership potential. Great, and I know we're slightly over the hour, so I really wanna make sure I'm not keeping anyone on too long, but, um... You know, any sort of last comments about commu how to get, uh, you know, this type of programming or an initiative going in a community? And also, we should take, um, we should let Mike also unmute, Mike Childress unmute here, because I see you've got a question and would love to uh, let you ask that out loud. Okay, I'm just uh, really, more, I'm excited about the program. Uh, what we get... Um... This this recording sent to us so I can you see bet. it again. You bet. And if if you didn't register, you can drop your email in the in a direct message to me, and I'll make sure you get it. I think I did re-register. I think I registered, but I'm going to send it anyway just to make sure. Yep. No problem. And so, any um, takeaways for for our group and? Um, any, maybe uh, any sort of what would you do if you were in a leadership posi position in a community to try to pull in uh, this type of programming? Um, I would say uh, connect with us, please. <laughs> our emails are on the screen. Um, our websites are also in the chat and we're very happy to talk more about how what we're doing already in a place near you and um, opportunities coming up where you could experience this for yourself, either in custody or um, in these next few months in Wisconsin, our post-release programs are on Zoom. So I would love to have you join us if a full day in prison isn't feasible, two hours on Zoom in an evening. 
um, might be. So um, please do consider this wherever you are in the country. Happy to have you. Um, and I know Melissa has upcoming events too. She can tell you about. I would love to attend. As president of the DuPage County NAACP, that's something that we really are interested in. That's great. Well, and that kind of dovetails to, I guess, my call of action um, is also around um, helping us increase our brand awareness. Um, we don't want to be uh, the best kept secret um, in Illinois or in Wisconsin. Um, we hope that you will take the information that you learned today um, and share it broadly with your own networks. Um, we are happy to do these kinds of presentations and socialize the importance uh, for why community um, needs to get involved um, in um, really writing the issue around um, mass incarceration in this country and how everybody has a role to play um, in providing support to those who've been impacted. So um, hope that you'll join us. Thank Again, you thank, so much. thank you so much to the participants and also our panel presenters. Uh, we really hope everyone has a great rest of their week and thank you for your interest in this topic and uh, in extension programs. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.